Welcome to the Amber Knight Superhero Podcast with Simo Suahemo. This show is your backstage pass to discussions with world-class influencers in the field of health, nutrition, and high performance. We bring you the selected tips and insights that you can use to upgrade your life and become unstoppable. Hello, I'm sitting here with Simo, the co-founder of Amber Knight, and I guess right now it's my turn to pick your brain yes that is correct <laughs> so in one of our previous conversations we talked about measuring vital signs and other stuff and you mentioned that you're actually a part of the quantified self movement here in finland so could you just elaborate on the kind of data you're measuring throughout the day in order to create those feedback loops which help us to improve things like sleep quality cognitive and physical function Yeah, definitely. So the things I measure start from, well, they, they encompass basically activity, sleep, food, and also work-related performance. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to be clear, I've experimented with a, with a, a, a big, big uh, variety of, of different trackers. But one thing I, I noticed really early on was that the uh, awareness of, of, a, of a certain uh, aspect of your life, be it, for example, your sleep, your activity, uh, I think that the main learnings and the main things Uh, can be incorporated into your into your daily kind of habits and routines pretty fast. So the things that I I'm currently especially interested, like right now, starting from you know like today today morning, that I'm especially interested in tracking, have to have currently to do with with uh, meditation, uh, as well as certain uh, physical capabilities. Like I, I currently have a have a challenge of uh, building upper body strength for climbing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a have a challenge for uh, for our pull-ups and, and a couple of other uh, uh, kind of meta techniques for that. But yeah, apart from uh, many many different things, I also have these ongoing challenges that are typically mm -hmm. typically one to to a twelve months to twelve months long. Interesting. So you mentioned meditation. Is there a certain way to measure like your performance regarding meditation? There actually is, and uh, and uh, one of the ways to measure that is is to uh, to uh, measure your brain waves and your brain state uh, in in a meditation. Mm. I'm I'm a, a, a big proponent of measuring kind of uh, whenever you want to build a new habit, start mm. to measure it because what get me gets measured gets done, as the old mantra goes. Gets quantified, yeah, and you yeah. can get some some real insights. Exactly, yeah. but I think uh, with some of the most useful, uh, uh, just basic ways of quantifying stuff. I mean, like uh, it, it doesn't be high tech all the time. Mm. It, it can also be as simple as keeping a keeping a routinely keeping a schedule okay. of of your meditation practice uh, and evaluating your feelings and and your mood afterwards and so, your effectiveness. So you're not wearing an EEG cap while doing meditation. I I am not doing that. <laughs> oh, even though even though many people are, and uh, and that's also something that I'm I'm uh, very interested in. But I feel that. At the current stage, especially well, when I'm beginning, and as a beginner, I'm, I'm talking about only a couple of years of, of practice. Mm. I think uh, the most useful thing is to make it make it uh, a part of your daily routine. Cool. So our listeners might ask themselves, how do they start small and get the critical bits and pieces together to really have a maximum impact in their daily lives and in their habit formation? Yeah, the biggest ones for me have uh, have definitely been uh, eating, sleeping, and exercise, and, and starting from sleep, which is awesome because that's the one that produces the most immediate effects. Hmm. For me, it's been about using trackers to track my uh, sleep time, sleep quality, as well as my sleeping rhythm. Now for that, I've been using Basis B1, mm -hmm. uh, which, I, which I got in 2014, which is the, uh, the uh, company producing the, the smartwatches, the smart trackers, wrist trackers, right. which was, uh, right. which was uh, later ac acquired by Intel. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're exceptionally smart devices in, in, in that you can essentially just wear wear one of one of their, their watches where you sleep and uh, you'll get your sleep data in terms of like a rough estimate of sleep quality during the night how many times you wake up but the uh, really interesting stuff comes from uh, the uh, effectiveness of your sleep and, and with that for example i made some concrete improvements into my sleeping habits and sleeping environments starting from temperature to uh, different beddings during different seasons. Yeah. As you know, that, that has massive impact on your body temperature throughout the night, on the, uh, on the temperature, on the heat, on the sweating. Uh, many people unknowingly are sleeping with a, 
uh, too much uh, clothing on uh, and too uh, thick blankets, which mm. end up in in a constant, constantly interrupting your sleep. Overheating, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So let me just ask you a little bit more concrete here. So you're wearing that uh, tracker on your wrist in order to like track your sleep movements, right? But do you also like uh, use something like a sensor which you put under your mattress? Yes, I do, and that's uh, the other sensor. That uh, is uh, the Bedit sensor, okay. uh, which is a uh, heart rate-based sleep tracker, which mm-hmm. you can actually just slip under the mattress, and it does the measuring for you. Interesting, very interesting. So, but I think you also the main problem might also be that you maybe invest too much into technological swag and get <laughs> get too much gear and too much little bits you just can just slap on. And it's, then you it's definitely, definitely, uh, yeah. uh, kind of the, the type of sport where you can get carried away with the equipment, but yet, yet not leveraging yeah. the uh, most value out of exactly. it. Exactly. Then you will end up like with something called analyzed paralysis, and you just get get generate too much data and not get real insights, right? So is that a problem you're also facing, or? I would say that as a kind of a novelty seeking personality with a and a type A personality, I think that's very common for mm. people to to uh, get all these sensors or you know like start tinkering with them. Mm. I think for for anyone interested in in uh, in uh, improving their their quality of life and improving their uh, their their uh, their surroundings, I think the basic stuff starts from the food, starts from tracking your daily activity, mm. starts from the basic places essentially where you spend the most time in, uh, which are probably your work desk probably your bed and uh, your house, your home. And, uh, and uh, many of those come down to how many, how, uh, like what kinds of routines you, you take, for example, for your commute, do you cycle, do you walk? Mm. Uh, the easiest stuff uh, to track doesn't need any investments and, and doesn't need any, any sensors. Mm. If you have a phone, if you have a smartphone in your pocket, you're probably already tracking many things, starting from how many stories of stairs did you walk a day? How many steps did you take? How many kilometers did you mm. walk? I think that's, you know, like the lowest hanging fruit mm. there. All right. But speaking of investment, so did you already or also make some experiences with those kind of open source measurement devices or open source sensors which are out there, like the Bitalino, for example? Uh, I have not tried that yet. No, yeah. no, that I have not yet tried. Because it sounds really interesting. You, I get you're getting like nine or ten different sensors for a hundred euros. Yeah, that's so, it's and super the whole, the whole software is completely open source. So it really would be interesting to tinker around with that instead of just buying like this nicely branded Fitbit or whatever. Definitely, so, yeah. and I think the open source open source philosophy suits yeah. suits well in, into the whole whole movement of quantified self and biohacking. All right. All right. So then maybe one more question regarding out of my viewpoint. So as a physician, sometimes I also see that my colleagues are basically overwhelmed with the kind of data their patients already are generating in a clinical setting. And now we just put on top of that the additional data of the quantified self. <laughs> so how a physician actually could handle those kind of data? So what, what, what is actually needed and um, really to get great insights and merge those clinical and quantified self data in one big data set and then really can generate those important insights. Do we have a take on that? That's a very interesting question. I think uh, only the people involved in uh, top-level athletics and mm. top-level athletics doctors are currently systematically equipped with, with the type of knowledge and the know-how to analyze this, this types of things. I think, you know, like probably the trainers of, of uh, athletes like Michael Phelps would be the first ones to kind of be able to share this knowledge with the world. I'm, what, I'm, what I'm personally seeing is that there, there are not many general practitioners who can actually you know, like really effectively take this data into account. So uh, in, in the biohacking scene, the norm seems to be like, do the maximum amount of studying yourself and then you know, like share your learnings. It's an open environment and people are really open to discuss about these. But in the end, I think it boils down to an N equals one type of experiment. Mm-hmm. So uh, currently, I wish there was a type of platform where you could upload your data and uh, and to have consistent medical opinions about it. I think those those platforms are already trying to be developed, but it's true. Uh, I think also like one main breakthrough would be the support of artificial intelligence AI in really to analyze the data quickly and precisely. So I think that might be a major breakthrough when we're at the state or at the stage that we can use AI to really crunch the numbers, and then give us concrete recommendations based on that. Definitely. Uh, Ambronite Superhero Podcast. Live life to the fullest. I think uh, the uh, advancement of AI is definitely going to be play a big part in that. I think many people think as AI as, you know, like as this this kind of a monster that, that just, you know, like substitutes human 
understanding and, and knowledge and you know like takes our jobs from the lower levels <laughs> levels of, of performance but but what actually what, what's actually also I think big and many argue the major part of AI is to enhance our our own performance is to is to enhance and, and exactly, augment exactly yeah. augment human performance yeah, yeah. and I think this is the type of yeah. uh, the type of connection that will also happen in in uh, AI make it easier for us to make better decisions. Yeah. I like that you mentioned it, but also from the point of view of a physician, I mean, it's not about replacing doctors by AI. It's really about extending the capabilities of the doctors with the AI. So to increase the efficiency of the treatment, increase the efficiency of the diagnosis. So it's really not really about completely replacing the doctor. So we still keep the human touch in the interaction between the doctor and the patient, but the AI will be an addition to that, which, as just mentioned, increased efficiency. That's exactly how I see it as well, and mm-hmm. and uh, I think it, it will in in the best scenario it will also open up more kind of you know like doc, the the doctor's attention and resources into the things where us humans mm-hmm. are currently not able to be replaced yeah. by by machines. Yeah. And our our resources, I mean, we are limited, right? I mean, there's we don't have like endless resources, time wise, whatever. So it's really about that we actually really in order to. To handle the, those kind of data or, or new developments, so we are we need those kind of extensions of our cognitive functions, for example. All right, so Simu, thank you very much for that interesting talk about the quantified self movement. Thank you, <laughs> Simu. Can you just just give top three examples of how you get started in that quantified self? So like, start start from the three main pillars, and it's really yeah. easy. You can start tracking your sleep. Firstly, which is, I'd argue, the, the easiest and most important thing. Yeah. You can get started today by downloading one of the free iPhone apps and then just uh, tracking your sleep with that one. Yeah. Essentially, it uses the iPhone sensors to track your sleep activity. So that's where you can start. You don't need an expensive sensor to do that first. And uh, the second one would be to, to track your exercise. And uh, your phone might be perfectly adequate for that too. Uh-huh. Start by tracking your you know, like daily steps, as I was just talking and uh, also logging, logging uh, heart rate data, for example, from your endurance sports, mm. and uh, and uh, uh, to to get it, gain a better understanding there. And uh, in the end, it, it comes down to it's no use measuring unless you're also doing the stuff that you're supposed to do. Mm. So so keeping us accountable and having that data in front of your eyes mm. actually helps us also subconsciously do the better decisions and stick to our regimes when it comes to sleep, mm. health, and and and, and uh, nutrition. And the third one, I'd say is to do a genetic test mm-hmm. of, of uh, 23andMe. I think that's, you know, like, uh, the earlier you do it, the more information you have to base your decisions on. For example, for me, as we've discussed, I've, I've made many, many interesting discoveries there, which have affected, for example, my diet. Could uh, give some examples for her? Absolutely. So, so the, uh, we, we already talked about the caffeine intake. Mm. I'm, a, I'm a caffeine slow metabolizer, so, so I've dialed that down in mm-hmm. favor of teas, Mm. For example, poor tea and and uh, and uh, green tea matcha. Some some other things include uh, improving my diet and and uh, my macronutrient intake on the basis that that uh, that uh, my response to to uh, sugar intake and insulin uh, is is a uh, uh, different and uh, needs a larger quantity of my calories mm. to come from uh, less starchy and, and more fat based, more protein based sources. Mm. So, so these are these are the kinds of you know like very concrete things that that also show on my plate uh, mm. every day. So, mm. so uh, I I highly suggest to get started with these. Mm. As you know, I always support the idea of opt for a genetic test. So I like the pillar number three very much. But coming back to pillar number one, so uh, the top one you were mentioning, so getting the sensors basically. So do you see some problems here? I mean, I've read about that there might be some uncertainty in the measurements regarding the heart rate if you use optical sensors. Do you have any experience on that? If if the kind of sensors you actually should choose in order to correctly and precisely measure your heart rate? I do. And, and uh, the fact is currently that the heart rate measurement features in, in, the, uh, in the smart wristbands are, are not entirely mature yet i mean like it's a it's a technology that takes vast leaps every six months and uh th- it's it's uh not entirely comparable to wearing an actual sports band that measures your heart rate mm. it's is not it's not there yet even though uh, looking for you know like the first versus basis to the newest version of the apple watch it has taken major leaps but it's, it's not the same thing but it's, it's not meant to be the same thing right because 
the, the main use for, for many of these smart wristbands is to give you a very, very rough baseline mm. rather than to be very accurate in terms of helping you train in, the, in, the, in a certain heart rate range, for example. That, that's a different thing. That's what you would use a heart rate monitor, a dedicated one for that. Uh, if you're if you're an athlete, for so, example, so you will get a, a relative, basically a relative baseline, and by that you would see changes, even though they might not represent your actual heart rate, but still you see like changes, right? Exactly, and that's all you need to know. Exactly at that stage. And, and what I what I like to say is that that uh, to the to the critics who say that the the technology isn't there yet, I like to say that that it's is not uh, as important to be uh, entirely accurate or objectively accurate. What you need is uh, adopt a certain way of measuring one aspect of your life mm. and then stick to it so you can see the relative improvements, just like you said. Uh, it, and it, it can be as, as easy as, as, a, as a just uh, weighing yourself every day and, uh, and a rating, and a, you know, like keeping you know, like a manual log of what you did during the day. Did you cycle to work? Did you walk to work? And then, you know, like just, just giving you yourself a number, you know, like how, how well the day went. Mm. And uh, in time, you will start to notice those patterns mm. Uh, from the basic three pillars of eating, sleeping, and and, and uh, exercise, and uh, and, uh, and understanding what makes a great day for you, and uh, out of great days is a great life constructed. So, that, so that's essentially how it works. All right. So, is there if you have to decide it upon one measurement, is there one measurement you will dis- regard as being the most helpful, having the most impact on your day life? Just if you decide upon one measurement. If, if I could yeah. only measure one thing, yeah. uh, it would be sleep because it has such a vast impact on our, on our uh, everyday experience of life, on our cognition, huh. and even on our longevity. And I think what I'm seeing in my own life and that those uh, who, are, who are getting started on this path, if you don't sleep well, hmm. you don't have the self-discipline to ed- do anything else well. I, I like the saying that if you don't have time for, for a seven to eight hour sleep every night, you'll have to budget time later for being sick oh, and, and, for, and, and for, for taking time off because it doesn't yeah. make any sense. Mm. It's, a, it's a, one of the most important biohacks you can make oh. is to sleep one hour longer. So that basically means you're not fulfilling the cliche of a sleep-deprived entrepreneur. Is that true? Is that uh, what you're trying to say here? That, that is, that is yeah. definitely what I'm striving, striving to be and uh, striving to complete. And yeah. I've actually managed to be very rigorous about this because uh, the efficiency benefits are just so tangible. Absolutely. So you're getting at least eight hours of sleep? I am, uh, I am consistently getting eight hours of sleep. And uh, during weekends, I, I aim for nine hours. Mm. Great, great. Okay. I mentioned in the beginning the core idea behind the quantified self movement. But Simo, maybe you can extend on that a little bit more and just give us like an idea of what's actually what it is, means for you and what's the, the main picture, the greater picture. Yeah, I think the, the greater picture, I think the term quantified self was uh, coined by Kevin Kelly, mm. the, the, uh, uh, one of the editors of Wired magazine in 2007, like, like generally employing tools to improve your life. Uh, and uh, and generally that means tracking and building those feedback loops that you mentioned and turning them into into actions uh, that lead to an upgraded version of yourself. Basically, mm. to me, I see quantified self uh, and and uh, and uh, the the kind of art and science of biohacking and and constant improvement as as a as an area of of uh, growing into growing into a basically better, more healthier, more efficient human being. And 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 in in that sense, to me, it's more about more about making making the efforts of self improvement quantified and making them you know like really count and uh, I think to me it, it, it the, the main values and the main principles there are obviously the, the main tenet there knowledge is power and but on the other hand also that I think every moment every day of our our lives consists of different types of investments that we make whether we're aware of those or not and I think one of the most important investments you can make in life. Is is uh, is uh, to understand yourself better, to learn about yourself, and uh, to to really get to know yourself on a on a deeper level than just the physical uh, sense, also on a on a psychological sense. Okay, and uh, that's uh, what quantified self uh, stands for me. All right, but just let me ask you. I mean, that might be a quite a philosophical question here, but do you think there's a limit to that, to that self quantification and to self improvement? Do we reach by perfectly measure ourselves a certain limit and we are not able to overcome that? That's a very interesting question. Is there like a global or a local 
maximum Ex- limit yeah. to self-improvement. What's your personal take on that? My personal take on that is there probably is for each person for every aspect of your life. For example, mm. if, if I were to become uh, an Olympic level swimmer, then probably given all the possible information on a theoretical level mm. and all possible execution, I think mm. there might be on the stage of current technology, there will probably, probably be some type of biological limit mm. that I can't exceed currently. But, but I think AI and, uh, and uh, enhancing technologies like bionics mm. and uh, gene editing will definitely change that. And uh, those technologies will, that, that are kind of transcending human uh, evolution mm. will help us also transcend those local limits. And fuse with the machine. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Amber Knight Superhero Podcast. Please check out the links, show notes, and other episodes at ambronite.com slash podcast. That's A-M-B-R-O-N-I-T-E dot com slash podcast. Thanks again, and catch you in the next episode.